Okay, everybody, have a seat. You all have your smocks, I hope. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Tables are covered. Um, I'm Michael Peshkin. Welcome to our uh, local and our Zoom participants who don't need a smock, I guess, today. Um, <laughs> our presenters today are Anna Kuzmanik and Justin Notstein. And they have both been here for about 15 years. And I think actually ran into each other about 15 years ago in a Searle uh, teaching yeah. workshop kind of thing, which is always a good sign, of course. We, start out teaching. Um, Anna is a professor in the Department of Theater, and she's been costume designer for a whole bunch of uh, theater and opera productions in the Chicago area at the Lyric, the Steppenwolf, and the Goodman, and also on Broadway and Off-Broadway and in Sydney and London, and a very long list. Um, and she teaches costume design, courses in costume design, and computer arts, and drawing and creative process, and collaboration, which I hear we're going to be hearing about. Um, Justin is a professor in chemical and biological engineering, and he and his group design catalysts and other materials relevant to uh, sustainability in fuel and industrial processes, um, and teaches chemical product design and has a special interest in design, um, but every engineer does design. So um, what do you have in common? Well, that's why I'm here is to find out like, What's the relationship? I hear there's some kind of incipient collaboration. Um, so what do you have in common? <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, you want to introduce yourself again a little bit more? Of so they course. can hear your voice. And everything. Of course. Best if you're over there. Oh, over here. Okay. Over there. Okay. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Anna Kuzmanich, uh, and uh, I teach in the theater department in the MFA program in stage design in School of Communication. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm originally from former Yugoslavia, uh, uh, more precisely from a, a city called Split uh, on the coast of the Adriatic Sea, uh, which is today uh, known as Croatia. And uh, I have been teaching at Northwestern for about uh, 15 years now. And I just want to add that the only time Justin and me met prior to this was 15 years ago <laughs> at Searle, Searle uh, uh, Fellowship event. So we were on the same campus for 15 years and we haven't distracted. Um, so that is enough. So um, yeah, I'm Justin Notstein. I'm in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. I'm also the director of the Catalysis Center here, which means I'm part of the Sustainability Center here. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd like to emphasize this notion that we've really had a shared interest in how people get inspired about ideas and how design happens, be it very different amongst fields, but we haven't interacted in 15 years. And this is sadly true in a lot of areas. I invited one of my colleagues to give a catalysis seminar last week, who I've only ever seen professionally speak in Germany. And we've been on the same campus for 15 years. So part of this that's come out of this is, is how do we build intersections, design at the intersections, uh, that may not look terribly intersecting at the very beginning. Hmm. Um, yeah. I, I also want to add that the two of us started a conversation uh, asking a question, are there any two disciplines more different than <laughs> our two disciplines? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> we, we, we assume there are very few. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I think we were going to walk you through uh, a couple of stories, uh, and then we're going to do kind of an activity that we thought about of how to spur creative thinking, um, which I run to as a challenge sometimes for my engineers. Um, and then we'll kind of close the loop and talk about these intersections, right? Yes. I was going to talk a little bit about just what I do, what That's is the purpose of yeah. my work. The, the, the purpose of what I do is to tell a story, to tell a visual story. And uh, what's inherent to the story is that it is not a straight line. It is a really winding road. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, all these turns and twists and uh, sometimes dead ends are what make a compelling story. And so it is, re it is not really possible to make a good story the shortest possible. Uh, it is not about the length, it is really about the experience. Um, and as a costume designer, I visualize what is invisible 
uh, starting with a text or a piece of music. And uh, so I put it into a visual form and I help also uh, visualize characters in a, in a piece of theater or sometimes it is adaptation of literature. Um, and uh, it, it, in doing that, I actually am visualizing something that is supposed to uh, evoke an emotional response from the audience. And sometimes those em that e emotional response could be targeted because art can certainly uh, the, you know, make the audience member pay attention to a certain issue, social justice or environmental issues. And sometimes also the purpose of art is uh, to, to cause emotional response just for the sake of it, to cause uh, intellectual or emotional pleasure, you know, to make the life more endurable. So in a nutshell, that's, that's what, what my work does. Yeah, and, and the, the theme of invisible also spoke to me as a chemical engineer I'm engineering chemicals at some level. So we might have taste and smell or chemical function, but rarely visual input is something I can immediately work with. However, at the same time, I, I will be very inspired by the appearance of an enzyme or the structure of something. Um, and so this is where we started talking. Um, and so this was, yeah, you wanted to talk about your example here? Yes, so sometimes the purpose of my work is also to create an illusion or even to be deceptive. And uh, you, uh, very often the audience know they're being deceived. And, and that's where the pleasure comes from. You're understanding that what you're seeing is not really what it is, but, but you're really happy about looking at that. And so here, this is a costume designed for a looking glass uh, theater production of Steadfast Teen Soldier. And mm, the task of the costume design for this character was to, to create an illusion of Jack in the Box. And so I uh, was brainstorming how this costume should be conceived and then, of course, how it should be engineered. And I realized that I need to cover legs and create other legs in order to create that, that illusion. So by actually covering the, the legs that were already there, which kind of seems uh, redundant, right? In a, in, a, in a normal circumstance, you would think, why do I need to get, take that away in order to just make another pair of something that is, that is the same thing? But in this case, it was important that the proportions are right, that the, 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 the performer's legs are contained in something that looks like it is static. So uh, to create both the, mo the movement and the static quality of the character. And to not do too much of a shift from the profound to the mundane, <laughs> um, this is not something I design, uh, but this is one of the examples I like to use at the beginning of my chemical product design class. So in chemical engineering, chemical process design is what has been called design for the entire history of chemical engineering. And that would be building a chemical plant to make a million pounds per year of styrene or something like that. This is the Uncrustables peanut butter and jelly sandwich by Smuckers. It's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's a frozen peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We at face value do not need to engineer a better peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, if you grew up in the United States, you have eaten countless peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in your lives and they all worked fine. But there's a set of constraints that you have to reimagine if you decide you want to make a frozen peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, this was a good one to ask of my students when I introduced this. What are some of the concerns that you have when you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, maybe pack it for lunch for your child or you took it to school? What are some of the things you hate about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when it goes wrong? Oozing. The oozing. The oozing is the number one problem. Peanut butter jelly wants to ooze out. A loss of jelly in preference to peanut butter. Exactly. Yeah. So that's actually the big balance that you have to do here when you're engineering a peanut butter jelly sandwich as opposed to making a peanut butter jelly sandwich. You cannot have the jelly ooze through the bread or out the sides. You cannot, however, make this out of cement or industrial adhesives because you have to eat this. So your only adhesive that you have available to you is peanut butter. Um, and so this is actually a very nicely peanut butter sealed packet, uh, but then it messes with your ratio. And this has generally speaking not been a very successful product, um, but it's these odd constraints that you have to work with in this chemical product design space. So 
So essentially, you're trying to replicate what is exciting about it yeah. and eliminate. The and eliminate all the problems. It's the classic design problem. Just our tools are a little bit different than in some other areas of design. Yeah. Very expensive to design this mm -hmm. and to sell. Right. So yeah. Uh, little bit more about about just design challenges uh, that are uh, that sound very different but in essence they, they are similar uh, here what you're looking at is the uh, costume design for uh, opera Eurydice at the Metropolitan Opera and it's a new opera that deals with the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice uh, in the modern retelling and uh, in this version uh, Hades meets Eurydice uh, in, the, in the real world, and, and he pretends to be something he's not. He pretends to be a human, and uh, not quite successfully, mind you. Uh, the color is too loud. There is this big pattern. He just he just doesn't quite get it. Uh, but uh, the reason, so that is kind of the, the big reason why he looks the way he looks. But for me, the reason why I chose this color was because I had a challenge. Uh, the challenge is that. Hades appears at the beginning of the play, uh, of the piece, and then he appears at the end of the piece. But at the end of the piece, he's 10 feet tall. And so he's described as looking very different, but the character recognizes him. And so my challenge was to make sure that the audience understand that it is the same character <laughs> who just looks differently. Um, and so I opted to just very, very, uh, specifically for a color that nobody else in the piece uh, uh, had assigned. Um, and it, it's this very, very specific color. And then I also started thinking in a very literal sense, how can I, what could that transformation be that would allow me to keep some of these key elements the same, but make him look really different. And literally I thought if something grows really rapidly, um, it might get warped out of shape. It might not follow the, 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 the trajectory. It might just get completely bent out of shape. And so, so, so my design was based on that fact. And so if you look at the drawing on the right, uh, it became this really long coat that, that stretched rapidly. So the, so, so the entire plaid became warped. But also I wanted to evoke a little bit of the, the fun house sense. And so, then that was on paper. And then of course we go through the entire process of testing and prototyping and finding the right materials. How can we make this a reality? Which we found some parallels uh, in, in process. So here you can see just some parts of the process. Uh, we were trying to create the custom uh, fabric design. And here you can see three different versions of it. Number one is the one we chose. And then when, when that was settled, then we needed to make sure that this uh, fabric design will actually fit and do what we want on the actual pattern for the garment. Um, and then before we actually uh, printed it and cut it in the actual fabric, we made a little mock-up, a paper mock-up to make sure that the lines and everything connects. So there was a lot of um, uh, of work, a few months of work to actually get it just perfect. And then what you see here is the final costume on stage. Yeah, and I, I liked making sure that this example was in here because it brings back the familiar language of like a design build test cycle that we talk about in engineering design, um, preceded by a very clear identification of what the needs are. That you have to be able to identify the same character, although it's changed over the course of the work, um, it needs to be distinct from the other characters. Uh, and this then brings us to a couple of examples here from your professional work and again my very prof profound work on avocados. <laughs> um, well, this work yeah. is so much more profound. I think you should talk about it. What, what okay, I'll start with this one. So in my class on chemical product design, we did. <laughs> we have uh, two design projects. Um, the first one talks about a class of products, generally speaking, called uh, formulated products or microstructured products. So these are a lot of creams and foods and things like that. And you can play with this in your kitchen. So they make for good take home projects. Um, this was actually a project done during the pandemic. 
Um, so they were actually done remotely in teams at their kitchens all over the country. Um, and we set up a sustainability challenge, which is how you can replace certain foods that might be unsustainable for whatever reason and replace it. Um, and this one group chose avocados. Avocados are very water intense. So there was a lot of work in figuring out why this was a sustainability challenge. But then that brings up the big question that for a food like guacamole, which by definition is mashed up avocados, how do you make that without avocados? So now you have to ask the question, well, it's not the shape of the avocado that matters. It's not necessarily even the color that matters because that's relatively easily replicated. It becomes things like texture. It becomes things like mouthfeel. It becomes smell. It becomes fat content. It becomes a lot of, frankly, good chemical types of questions. And then how do you replicate taste, texture, mouthfeel with certain mixtures of thickeners and uh, creams and all sorts of things like that. So this is actually a palette of testing from the group that looks horrendous, which is part of the reason why I like this particular picture. Um, as they are going through trying to replicate the specific mouthfeel of guacamole. And these are mixtures of uh, like nut butters and creams and things like that to, to get certain textures right that don't have the color down or even the specific avocado flavor, but it had that right creaminess and texture in your mouth. And so it was about breaking the problem down into its component parts as opposed to trying to directly replicate is the experience of guacamole as opposed to how can we make a different avocado? I guess that would be another lab within the university. We could genetically engineer our avocados or something. <laughs> but that wasn't, that wasn't the product design type of cube. So. But then th this idea of like ersatz versions is, was spoke to you in a particular way. Yes, it was really uh, interesting to, to us to put this slide together because there is the real inspiration. And then that inspiration gets translated into, uh, into something, into, into a, a product. And, uh, and then in the case of the costume design, the drawing itself is not the product. The real engineering starts once you have that, that, that drawing is really just, just a blueprint. Um, and it was also interesting to me how sometimes you are, you're having these opposite you have to marry the opposites. My inspiration was this incredible rock formation in Arches National Park, which by the way is my favorite place on earth. It's so beautiful. Um, and the fact that it's called the Three Gossips just convinced my director that, that those are the stones in our piece. They just stayed there. And so then when I developed the design, the question was, well, these stones, they're called stones and stones when I think about it, stones are, there are properties of stones. One of them is the weight. Um, stones are not really light, but the, the, the performance, the performers in the costume have to move very lightly and have to be uh, a, a kind of contradicting their, look, their looks. And so I had to use the properties of stones to my advantage, which was a little, uh, their costumes were made of stacked pieces so that they could sit down, kneel, do everything that stones normally do not do, and yet look like they were really heavy and made out of out of the substance that the stone is made out of. Yeah. Abstracting the essence. Right. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, and then this is the example that kind of brought us together. So you, you want to tell a little bit about what your original idea was and then what happened when you came to one of our friends here? Yes. Um, so this is also designed uh, for for the same opera, Eurydice. Uh, Eurydice is the main character, and what happens is that when she dies, she goes to the underworld, and in this piece, she forgets everything, and she forgets the language. Um, and uh, in the underworld, she meets her father, and he slowly starts teaching her the language, and so she starts remembering, which gives her a, a temporary bliss, but also overwhelms her with grief for the loss, for the loss of uh, her life, for the loss of her father, for the loss of her uh, fiance or husband who stayed in the other world. And it was such an overwhelming loss. And because it's an opera, it's really in the music. Grief is in the music. And so uh, I, I was tasked with visualizing the grief. And uh, what I really wanted is, is this, I wanted 
her on stage gradually becoming darker because the space of the underworld was uh, like charred wood. It was really dark. And so, so I wanted to show how actually the grief and the, the mixture of her dwelling there is affecting her physically. So I wanted this, but I actually got that, which worked. So I did my work. I, as my photographer, loved it. It was a great design in their opinion. Um, this, what you're seeing here, is one of the painted dresses. It was one of the four. The fourth one was the, the all white wedding dress, uh, which would be there on the, on the left side. On, I don't have it here, but it would be the first one. Um, so I got four different illustrations of the process. And while my job was done, I was satisfied. The artist in me was not quite satisfied with how, with that, with that idea, because what I really wanted was a reaction, some kind of a reaction in real time, some kind of transformation. And that's when I approached Dino Tino with this question, if, if, there, if there are ways to do this, in chemistry, if there are any scientific ways to approach this, and of course, you know, then connected me to Justin. Yeah, because you said the magic word, you said reaction. <laughs> um, most people would describe my field as reaction engineering. Um, and so then we met over coffee and we started to brainstorm, what are some of the ways that you could make this dynamic dress? Would it happen in real time? Would it be, uh, again, something that could be in the foyer? And the, uh, we had that same problem with the small image. Mm -hmm. In coming up with ideas, we ran into lots and lots of very practical constraints. Um, I had wonderful, in my opinion, ideas about sulfur compounds and, and toxic metals and, and all sorts of reacting components, which were probably impractical for stage or the lobby of a opera in New York City. Uh, but we started talking about things like thermochromic paints. Um, so you could actually have various images painted and then they would respond uh, to temperature. Yeah. yeah. And as we started talking, as we started talking, then all these things started coming up. Okay, if we, for example, use thermochromic paint, then we would need a way to control it. And we can control it by perhaps controlling the temperature, what you're seeing here is actually uh, cooling and heating. The, the pattern has been silk screened. And then we are using this, this um, uh, cooling and heating of the pattern to actually try and control the, 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 the transformation. Uh, but then there are all these other questions, then maybe this couldn't be worn. Maybe this should be more in a sculptural form. Maybe this couldn't be presented on stage. Maybe it is uh, an object that is rather than a functional garment. Um, and there were all these other questions. So one of the interesting things to me was many of the constraints were not practical, but artistic. From the point of view that, for example, you could have made this with um, fibers that themselves were responsive. And so you could actually uh, program in a pattern that would evolve. But you really wanted the reaction. That was the word that kept coming. We really actually want to engineer an organic occurrence that you would interact with the environment and something would appear. It wouldn't be pre-programmed in. And so this was a, you know, a compromise to that because the, the image would come in somewhat randomly in response to temperature. But we were really looking for an artistic statement that was then designed using, say, chemical principles. Um, and it didn't fully happen. No, but, but then, you know, it, it was, it, what was happening was that the question started shifting a little bit. And, you know, even sh should, it be, should it be addressed? Um, uh, or or uh, that departure was becoming a little bit more, the actual process was becoming more important and seductive almost. Yes. Then, the, the, the original dress idea. And it's worth noting that we haven't come up with solution. If you were uh, expecting the next slide to show you this <laughs> incredible dress, we haven't done that yet. We, we want to continue talking and, and experimenting. But um, uh, what, what I wanted to say is that what we realized is that every time you ask those what if questions, 
you really open open something new. You usually open a new set of problems. It could be perceived as a set of problems. I would call it a new can of worms that you didn't want to open, didn't know that would happen, and you regret it. But then when you overcome it, you, you are maybe on the road to go to a new direction, a different direction. And that's what was exciting to yeah. us. And, and that's what I think we're going to try to like replicate here today briefly, right? I think we're at this stage. So the, the question was, you know, I got inspired by this. One of my design groups this year is actually playing around thermochromic paints for like temperature regulation in buildings because we started talking and hanging out. And so one of my questions was, how do I get chemical engineers to think creatively? How do we start engineering in this intersection? And so we were going to try a, a little activity here today, right? Yes. Um, so, um, we have a bunch of supplies that we've given you, um, they can do a couple of things. Why don't you explain what are some of the possible functions of this? Okay. Oh yeah, why don't you grab those? I distribute them to everybody, but then I... I and then at, at the same time, we're going to give you design prompts for my chemical product design class. And we're going to see how these play and see how if the art influences the ideas you might come up with or how the ideas might influence the art that you generate. Um, yeah. And for those at home, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, so Justin, the way this activity is going to go is Justin is going to give you a specific prompt uh, that will be probably written uh, or you would use your probably your pen with it with it because I don't know what that will be and how to do it I will not attempt to do it but then um, uh, you have the inks and you have these supplies uh, uh, we'll ask you to continue using these un uh, elements that are very hard to control so uh, you have the spray bottle and you have the black ink as the default. I would say the black ink would be kind of like a pencil. Um, and so, and the ink is one of those techniques that it's not for casual. You have to really, you fall in love with ink and it's for, it's not like two week date. It's like forever <laughs> because it dries and it stays. It's not gonna, it's not gonna move. But so what you might wanna do when you write what Justin asks you to write, you can decide that you will not care and you will just splatter some ink. You might decide that you want controlled splatters that actually don't cover what you've done, but maybe selectively cover things. You might decide that you just want it in the corners, but I will show you what I would like you to do is to um, start with the spray bottle. And so you, I'm, gonna open, oops, I'm gonna open this. Just, uh, Michael, I hope not to make a mess. <laughs> um, so, so what you can do, for example, you can spray some water. You don't, don't do it now. Don't, don't do it now. This is just because we want you to do both of these activities continuously. That's why I'm showing you this. This will be the second. So you can spray some water and then you can decide to, um, to splash some ink like this, you might decide to, 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 to just guide it a little bit to go somewhere where you want it to go. Then it will really be up to you. Let's say you have some writing you don't want to cover. You might try and direct the ink other ways. Uh, this is an incredible tool. It will just blot and, and your ink is just going to be more or less set. You might decide that you want to add some uh, color, let's say in this little window that I have there, but if I don't have any water there, it will just sit there so you can move it by again spraying. And so you're going to start getting something and you might start making associations in your head and you will forget probably the first part of the assignment and focus <laughs> on guiding your ink. And that's the point. And so again, profound to the mundane, I want to give two design prompts. This will seem familiar. On this side of the room, I want to do the first part of design when I ask questions in my product design class. What is it that you want out of an air freshener? So this is the needs identification part of things. An air freshener is something that you could mechanically design. There's a whole lot of chemical design in air fresheners as well. So those are the things I'd like you to write down. What are some of your needs 
out of an air freshener, these two tables. And then these other two tables, this is a design prompt from a different, and I've given you some examples of air fresheners. This is a design prompt from a few years ago. In 2015, Kraft and Heinz merged. And I actually gave the students the design prompt of, to physically merge two of their products. So this won't be a needs identification. This will be more on the end of, of idea generation. Brainstorm some ideas that could be combinations of a Kraft product and a Heinz product. It's relatively familiar brand names for many people, but I've shown many of their, this is from their website, which has this horrible name of myfoodandfamily.com. Um, but these are some of the, the classic brands of these. So brainstorm some ways to combine a Heinz product and a Kraft product. And then we'll come back and I'll discuss a little bit about what has been done for product development and what some of the students came up with. So I would say take, and you can do this in groups, it doesn't really matter. Take like five minutes to write down some ideas. Three, three. Three, three minutes. And then we'll start doing embellishments. Three minutes. Anywhere? Three minutes. Okay. okay. On your piece of paper. Yeah, that's the, the point of this. We want the ideas on the paper and then you're gonna embellish it. And we'll see what happens. I don't know what's gonna happen. It doesn't smell anymore. Yeah, not too overpowering. So start start writing these things down. It's it's not good for brainstorming if you're not writing it down, right? You have total of six minutes. So put it. So some of these brands might not be recognizable to everybody. I have no idea what Plasmon is. This sounds like what Emily Weiss does. Who knows Emily Weiss? In fact, this is what she does. Um, combine something. Heinz is ketchup. At a minimum, you can do ketchup. This was a very strange year for design. I will. I something you ever smell. I don't know. I feel like they should come up with I think it's Italian. I'm going to look up what that is. <laughs> Lee and Perrin's is Worcestershire sauce. Object assumptions. I know that. Weight Watchers. Yeah. Yeah. You've got all sorts of potatoes. It's different. So, yeah, potatoes plus feta. Um, it's baby oh. food. It's baby food. <laughs> Plasmon is baby food. That's actually great to work with. Okay, wait, what is it? Plasmon. Plasmon. Oh, we have that in my cart. Actually, See? I didn't listen. You <laughs> see? <laughs> non electric. Doesn't have to be plugged in. Yes, right now. Non electric. Think about the cat, the, the like, do you want it? What do you want it to smell like? What do you not want it to smell like? Right? Smells good. Like Easy to get spread in a room. Right. What else do you need? Like, cost a million dollars? Uh, you know, specific smells that it would taste like. And then beyond that, what do you really need it to do? Do you need it to smell good? Do you need it to not smell bad? Those are two different things. Are we not too wet? You know, the ones that go. Good. We've got some ideas coming up. No. Think about foods that you would actually encounter that might combine some of these things. Right? So Heinz and potatoes are already natural. You put your ketchup on your potatoes, but maybe you put cheese on potatoes. Oh. Um, we got all sorts of good stuff over here. <laughs> cheese, hot dogs. Oh, oh. Kraft owns everything. Kraft Heinz basically owns everything I eat, which is frightening. <laughs> So, 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 if one group wrote it on a scrap piece of paper, you should write it on your good paper. Yes, write it on the good paper. You're writing it on the good paper. Yeah. Take one more minute. Okay, we do these activities in my class in groups. Uh, because a lot of these things don't come naturally. I don't know why I'm standing back here. We do play a lot with food in my class. It's fun. Also because honestly, it's mostly junior chemical engineers. They are quite done with differential equations by this point in their career. And so we get to have a little fun catch up. So, all right. If you feel like you've got a few things written down on your piece of paper, why don't you break out the ink and the spray bottles? Okay, do whatever you want. 
Are you going to cover over everything? You're going to highlight things? You're going to whatever. If you don't like your list, you might cover everything. If you love your list, you might still cover it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's, it's hard to control the ink, and it's on purpose so you don't feel guilty. Yeah. So, yeah, like spray it, put some ink on, move it around. Remember the way I showed you, I should start with spraying because that will help you for ink just do something like awesome. Like combine like new products. So like that's yeah. what I started doing. I know these are so bad. I would never buy them. I would buy the first one that I made. These <laughs> products are out there for a week or two. Don't last. I can give you a brush, Michael. Do you want that? Sure. Oh yeah, we've got brushes. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> wants brushes? Oh, make sure you shake up your ink. Yeah, but it's fabulous. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, get, yes. If you're going to shake the ink, close it first. It has a tendency to phase separate a little bit. Don't be afraid of the spray bottle. <laughs> I, I suggest you do not use brushes unless you really use them. That's no fun. I'm going to be fine with that. Oh, yes, right. yeah, oh, yes, you don't need a brush. Look at that. Don't use them unless you really have to. Oh, that's so great. Look how different. Two different yeah. characters. Oh, yes. <laughs> do you want to share? I want to explain. Oh, don't get it on the furniture. Uh, so. What's this? Oh, yeah. Uh, really cool marbling with the light. <laughs> you also have uh, the paper towel in case you just you want a blot, paper towel, or if you need to blot, there's paper towels. I do. All right. Is everything going okay? Yeah. Uh, Mitra's trying to participate by chance. Uh, yeah. So maybe one more minute, and then it would be great for everybody to hold your work up just to see around the room what you have done. That's the yeah, Show it off. For this also, yeah, don't hey, for it to dry. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think Mitra has a question. Oh. I have some ideas about what I want in an air freshener. That's a great idea. I uh, didn't see those. Yeah, right. Those if you've got right. some era brainstorming ideas, put it in there, Mitra. Thank you. Yeah, there was in the chat, but I, yeah. Missed it. We missed it. It's okay. This worked surprisingly well over Zoom uh, when I gave this. No phthalates. Good general idea. One of my favorite words, though, the PHTH combo. Is just, come on. So is everybody as messy as they can get? <laughs> kind of. So so yeah. Hold up your things. Let's let's take a look. See what yeah. people have generated. Just look at everybody's. Let's look around the room to see what people have made. How many different ideas there are? Not only in color, but also in intersecting lines, leading shapes, in definitely characters, celestial bodies. <laughs> All these completely different things with the same prompt. So now what you might want to do is grab the frame. So, yep. so now here, here's the, this is the hard part when you're teaching art. The hard part is to, to, be, to, to figure out, so what do I do with this? Uh, how do I use it? Um, and so the reason why you have these mats is so you can use it as a viewfinder, right, to decide what is the hierarchy of my ideas? What is the most important? And yes, you could you could go by appearance. You might decide that this is what you really like the most, right? You might decide that you want it centered. You might decide that you are not really liking the red as much, the color as much. 
So the point of this viewfinder, or it's going to be a very nice art artwork for you, Matt. It's these you can take home. <laughs> But the point is that you now look at what you've done and see how many different ideas you will see just by moving it, just by looking at what you've done through a different lens. So spend a minute doing this, find the one you like, and uh, you don't have to spend time on this so, now, yeah. but you can use the tape when we're done, you can use the tape to tape it in place so it stays the way you want it. Yeah. And you might be, you know, framing the ideas, you might be framing the images, you might be framing both. But the point is you're you're framing it literally and you're reframing it in your mind. So take a minute to, to kind of look around. And in this process, you are staying open to the question, and the question might morph. And this is a wonderful way to just continue thinking and rethinking and putting uh, uh, associations together that maybe you wouldn't have. Yeah. Um, as people are doing this, I wanted to, to mention part of the, the chemistry behind these design inspirations. So in um, air fresheners, and again, I didn't get feedback about what your ideas were with the air fresheners. It's not kind of the point for today. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention is we had the little pine tree and then we had a glade and then we had Febreze. The first two molecules, so pine air freshener has a specific molecule involved with it. The uh, Febreze is much more of a formulated mixture of fragrances, which will be a whole variety of particular structures that give you different odors and fragrances. Febreze is a fundamentally different product. The first two are all about adding a fragrance to the room. Febreze actually subtracts fragrances. And until you frame the question of, is it that I need the room to smell good or is it that I need the room to not smell bad, you are open up to different things. And then you can think about how do I not make the room smell bad? And one of the more interesting modern ways has been via these molecules that actually absorb particular smell molecules and they actually fall out of the air, wind up in your carpet, and then you vacuum them off. Um, I wanted to highlight one of the, oh, did it get deleted? Oh, no. Maybe it's after, is it after? Uh, no, get deleted. Maybe it's hidden. Oh, it got deleted somehow. Oh, no, I must have written over it. Ah, oh, I will, uh, nah, it, it doesn't matter. What, um, in the combination of products, what the students realized one year with the Kraft Heinz combo is that it wasn't actually like ketchup plus cheese. What's the great thing about American cheese? It's not the cheese. Horrible. So, well, my grandfather loved American cheese, but it's the fact that it's in a single serving. And so we actually had a student group come up with sliced ketchup, which was fantastic. So they formulated ketchup with a whole lot of thickeners and they made it into sheets and you could have a single serving slice of ketchup. <laughs> and it was, oh, it was, mm. but that was the, the, the actual thing. You started asking about it. it wasn't the product per se, it was some of the technology underlying the product that could then make for something that people wanted. It is actually a real product in Japan, as it turns out. They have sliced uh, like mustard, mayonnaise, sliced ketchup, single serving packets. It's reframing the question. It is. It's such yeah. an excellent example of that. Ah, oh, well. Um, I, I wanted now to, to um, uh, add to what jo uh, Justin was saying by just using an example from a class. Uh, in this class that uh, I taught last quarter, the students needed to develop a visual response to uh, a, a written piece. And uh, they, they were supposed to summarize the gist of the, the novel or a story for that. And this student chose very ambitiously Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. This student is a second year MFA candidate in stage design, Hannah Clark. And I, I will read a little bit just to give you a rationale. So how Hannah didn't care about Frankenstein at all. Uh, all she cared for was the monster. 
She hated Frankenstein for abandoning his creation. How dare he? She decided to tell a story of Frankenstein as a modern day Prometheus, of the actual um, modern day Prometheus living in repetitive cycle of forgetting what he has done and then seeing himself for what he truly is, a monster. Uh, Hannah built a machine to support this repetitive cycle through a series of images. But in the end, the machine didn't work. The machine was broken. And so you can see the machine at left. This uh, little piece uh, with, a, with a big um, circle in the front, that is the machine. In the middle, you can see one of the main images from this roster of images on the circle, uh, which shows monster looking at himself in the mirror or Frankenstein looking at himself in the mirror. And here on the right side uh, is a little video of how the machine works, which I will just play for, for the fun of it. So there was a lens that, that provided for, for visibility and then the wheel was turning and projecting the images onto the, the, the plane. And that was the, the whole process. And so Hannah was really resentful towards this failure of her machine. Um, and in that, she actually found compassion for Frankenstein. Uh, so this artistic journey was the discovery of empathy itself through an artistic process. And for her, the process became the product. And by the end of this process, she fully understood and really empathized with Frankenstein, who she resented at the beginning completely. Even though in Hannah's mind, this project was a failure, I, I didn't think so. I thought it was quite extraordinary <laughs> as a journey. So that is that is a little bit of what we do in theater department. So I, I wanted to, at the very end, segue a little bit. So um, I don't do chemical product design for my career, as it were, right? So this is yet another one of the challenges with being an academic that my classroom activities are not how I'm judged externally by and large. I'm in the field of heterogeneous catalysis. I design catalysts, but yet this question of what inspires me is still there. What do I choose to go design? What do I choose to go build? Is not simply the Department of Energy says, go make me this thing that's 5% better. I have to decide in certain areas to work. So I've shown you, for example, in the upper left, this is actually from Amy Rosenzweig's lab, who's a world expert here on campus. This is the structure of particulate methane monooxidase, which is an enzyme that converts methane to methanol. And it's beautiful. It has this wonderful helical structure. This is actually the structure from electron microscopy. Um, what is the functional component of it is embedded in that little blue square there. And if it were the same size, it's this little blue square to the right, and it's one or two copper atoms. And this actually is what inspired me to go look at copper-based catalysts for this selective oxidation reaction. I could have picked any of the million ways to do this, but I simply thought this was beautiful and interesting and worth pursuing. Again, from the profound of the mundane, when I started my career, I was looking at some selective oxidation catalysts, and I discovered Persil Power, which in the UK had a version of their laundry detergent, which was pulled from the market for being too effective. I researched why it was too effective, and it turned out it contained a catalytic material that was eating everybody's underwear. I thought that was fun and exciting, and I could do something with that as an engineer because I like things that are extremely active room temperature catalysts, and so I built a whole family of catalysts based out of this manganese complex. The point is you get inspired by strange things. Your paths can fork all over the place, but you have to get interested in some of these. And so that's kind of where we, we wound up, right? We did, yes. and I, I'm fa just. I just want to say that I'm fascinated by how Justin articulates the the, the problem and even the new question in a matter of minutes. And for me, as an artist, it is a long, it is a much longer road. And sometimes the you don't know what you are setting out to do, uh, in, in the sense of I don't know what I'm looking for. I maybe I will stumble on it. That is not really. We don't stumble on things. There is a lot of research and a lot of thought invested in it. But uh, because my visual is medium, I'm not as good at, at articulating exactly what the findings are and how they happen. I want to show you the, just the last 
two slides be before we uh, wrap up. Go to. Um, this just illustrates a little bit of what you've done. And I just wanna, wanna show you the thought process uh, because really uh, new perspectives open new roads and uh, that's how innovation happens. On the left here, you're seeing an ink blot, like what you've done, right? And then on the right side, you're seeing a drawing that was developed from that ink blot. Now, if you look at the drawing of the figure, I don't know, can, I, can anybody see the figure on the right? The figure that's kind of leaning forward, right? The hand coming out the and out of the bottom. The head. But then when you go back and look at the ink blot, can you see the figure in that ink blot now? You can, right? Now, that's what's really super fun, but this is even more fun. This is the same ink blot, right? And this is the drawing on the right that has been developed from that ink blot, completely different drawing. Now look at the drawing and then look back at that same ink blot. Do you see the drawing on the right? But you didn't see it previously, right? right. And so this is just a, uh, something in terms of how, how, how we as visual designers are sometimes finding something that you can't maybe quite articulate. This is exactly the steps that I took but we can, we can understand it on this uh, perhaps more subliminal or emotional level. And I think we wanted to end with kind of the question of, of how can we make some of this process of getting inspired by really different things, more organic, give it space to happen here on campus. So this is actually a, a picture I found from the bio art laboratory at the School of Visual Arts in New York where this is actually an art studio, but it's got microscopes, it's got fish tanks and things like that. Um, what I would find incredibly fascinating is to more merge the disparate spaces here on campus. There's always talk about the serendipitous conversations you have walking through tech or something like that, but it's, it would be amazing if it were even more than that. If my lab was not adjacent just to another catalysis lab and I get inspired by the reaction they're running, but also the art that's being created um, and both ways. Um, and so in these, these are, um, again, you're getting inspired with the natural world that's surrounding you or technological images that are happening around you. But I would, again, love to see it happen the other way as well. I think it's easy to forget that engineers can be inspired by art uh, as well. So. And just to add to that, uh, I think that the, the, the what should happen in this lab would be not the straight line, shortest road from start to finish, but it should allow for that winding road of, of the story in terms of the process with all its segues and dead ends and twists and turns in terms of the ideas and perspectives. I think we are happy to take any questions for anything time that remains. And we're